Morning again. Good to see you all. Today is our third parable through the book of Luke. We have already looked at the Good Samaritan, the friend at midnight, and today we'll look at the rich fool. Uh, the setting took place in a crowd. Uh, Jesus was not, let me stress, was not there to teach them specifically. He was in fact mostly teaching the twelve. Uh, however, as Jesus was quite famous by then, some in the crowd wanted to engage with Jesus, right? And in this case, Jesus responded. Thus viewed, right, today, today's text is what we might call an object lesson, right? Jesus was using a question from the crowd not to teach the crowd, because in the back of his mind, right, he was actually intentional on teaching the twelve, right? In other words, we need to put ourselves in the shoes of the twelve, not the crowd, right, to better understand what Jesus meant, right? Jesus put ourselves in the shoes of the twelve, not the crowd. And to put ourselves in the shoes of the twelve, we, we need to know what they were up to at that time, right? Um, the twelve were, in fact, uh, on a learning tour. They were touring with Jesus at the time. They had just had a meal at a Pharisee's house, where Jesus, even though he was the guest, used the occasion to rebuke the Pharisees and experts in the law. Right. And after dinner, right, when they had left, right, they were back on the streets, and Jesus was still going on about the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. Right? That's what the twelve were on about at the time. Jesus highlighted two things. Right? There was a contrast between the seemingly pious Pharisees who in reality would one day be reviewed as corrupt. And that although the Pharisees were in authority and would likely seek revenge and persecute the twelve, that they were in fact under heavenly protection. So two contrasts, the Pharisees right, looked pious but were in fact corrupt. The Pharisees looked powerful and probably would persecute the twelve, but the twelve were in fact under heavenly protection. So Jesus, all in all, was teaching a series of lessons on the distinction between what seems to be and what is. Right? Or if we were to put it in Jesus' perspective, what Jesus sees versus what the world sees. What Jesus sees versus what the world sees. Now, that's how we are to align ourselves as we get into this parable. So let's have an overview of the text. Um, verses 13 and 14 uh, is a warning against greed. Um, 15 to 20 is the contrast of true wealth. And then 21 is an admonition towards heaven. So let's start from the beginning. Verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, Watch out. Be on guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Right. The context of the parable is in verse 14. Jesus was not interested. He was not interested in judging the man's dispute with his brother. Right? So the parable, the parable was neither to address his request directly, nor does it contain the resolution to the dispute. The parable has got nothing to do with his request for an arbiter, and it has got nothing to do with the resolution to that inheritance, that, that the estate dispute. Jesus merely took advantage of the situation to teach the disciples. Now with that, we can go back to verse 13. The request to redistribute the inheritance possibly stemmed from the Mosaic law that grants the eldest son a double share of the inheritance. So say there were two brothers, right? The elder would get two-thirds and the younger would get one-third. That's the law. In practice, this is more complicated because a typical Jew might own a small piece of land with a house, 
Dividing by three is not always possible, nor was selling it to cash in an easy alternative because of other mosaic laws governing the disposal of properties and, and, and houses. All right? Not to mention that there were Roman laws on top all right, that would also apply. So as a result, inheritance were not always divided evenly and disputes would follow. That man on the street could have been harboring such discontentment and therefore sought Jesus' arbitration. Now this is all conjecture, of course, right? Just a guess given, given the setting at the time. Either way, it's obvious that Jesus was not very interested, right? Since he knows all facts, right, and is able to discern all hearts, he would have known the true motive of the man. So when Jesus said, who appointed me judge or an arbiter between you? He didn't mean, he did not mean that he could have judged or arbitrated. Rather, it was a common saying, for example, from Exodus 2.14, that meant, this is none of my business. Jesus said, this is none of my business, right? Jesus, knowing all things, including the hearts of all, decided that it was not the wisest use of his time nor power to respond to this person in the crowd. To Jesus, teaching the twelve was more important in that situation, so he dismissed the man and began to teach. All right, let's read it together. Verse 16. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I'll store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? At first reading, I found this very difficult to interpret. And even now, I'm struggling a bit. So do bear with me. Now recalling that the background to this parable was that Jesus was actually teaching the twelve on the contrast between what he saw and what the world sees, right? call that perception versus reality if you want, how would this fit? Well, the rich man perceived a great future, while reality was that he was about to die, right? So we do have such a contrast, that's, that's good, right? At least we have something that fits. So keep this in mind for the time being. There is no suggestion, there is no suggestion whatsoever that this man got his harvest through improper means. For example, he most probably did not steal that piece of land, right? He got a good harvest as a combined result of hard work, protection from harm, and of course, blessing of suitable weather. In that sense, in that sense, God blessed him. And what did he decide to do next? This is what we read. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store my surplus gains. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. What was Jesus' point here? And this is where things get difficult. The rich man made two plans. One, he decided to build a bigger barn. And two, right, he decided to take things easy thereafter. How are we to look at these two plans? Well, let's look at the barn first. In every way, this was the right idea. He was planning ahead. There was nothing immoral or unbiblical about that at all. In the Old Testament, a full barn was a sign of God's blessings, for example, from Proverbs 3.10. And in the New Testament, Jesus would teach about planning ahead, for example, in Luke 14.28. God is in favor of planning. 
And of course, so is Jesus. So the plan to build bigger barns was not at fault. What about wanting to take things easy? Now we have no idea how old he was. Perhaps he had worked hard all his life and this was his retirement opportunity. Nothing wrong with that. Unless we jump on that critical wagon too casually, there is even nothing wrong with wanting to eat, drink, and be merry. There is nothing wrong with wanting to eat, drink, and be merry. Ecclesiastes makes it very clear, for example, in 3.13 or 9.7, that being able to eat, drink, and enjoy the work of our hands is a gift from God. So, neither the plan to build a bigger barn, nor the desire to take things easy afterwards, were wrong. Neither of them were wrong. So what's left to learn? Let's look at verse 20. But God said to him, You fool! This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? Seemingly, seemingly, the criticism was that he wasn't aware that he was about to die. Had he known, he should have handled his abundant harvest differently. He wasn't aware that he was about to die, and had he known, he should have handled his harvest differently. Fair enough? No, not fair enough at all. Which one of us knows exactly when we're going to die? Not as in the indefinite sense, but as in knowing the exact date or hour. No one. Right? So why did Jesus single him out for criticism? If not knowing when we're about to die, right, therefore not making suitable plans is a fault, then all of us, not just the rich fool, all of us are at fault. So now we can see why this parable is difficult. What the rich man did was in fact biblical. And what Jesus seemingly criticized him for was in fact unknowable. So either Jesus gave the wrong lesson, or there's something else that we need to look at. Now we shouldn't entertain the idea that Jesus gave a wrong lesson. So let's see what else we can look at. The background to the parable was Jesus' lesson on what seems to be versus what is. So let's see how that might apply. Let's revisit the man who raised the issue of his estate, his probate, to Jesus. The basis of his questions was on the law of inheritance, right? He said his brother had not divided evenly with him, right? So what seemed to be was that the law was not properly applied. So what might have been the contrasting reality? As my early example shown, right, you know, a piece of land and a house, how do you divide it by three and then two thirds and one third? Very difficult, right? Not to mention Mosaic law plus Roman laws, right? We have lawyers here, you know how awkward it can be, right? So God's law is perfect. And when he returns, he will judge perfectly using the exact same laws. Make no mistakes, the law is perfect. But we're not God, we're not God. And the world, no matter God's people or not, seldom applies the law perfectly. This isn't God's fault. This is our limitation. So the first point to note is the constant gap between God's perfect law and our limitation as his laws is applied. There's always a gap. And it might sound silly that God would set laws that are unimplementable. But of course, God is never silly. Recalling that Jesus had just had a meal with the Pharisees, and during that meal, he said this in Luke 11:42. Woe to you, Pharisees, because you give God a tenth of your mint, rue, and all kinds of garden herbs, but you neglect the justice and the love of God. You should have practiced the latter without leaving the former undone. Jesus was not just reprimanding the Pharisees. He was giving a lesson that God's justice, God's law, 
in the hands of God's people should always be practiced with love. The Pharisees missed that, and so did the man in the crowd. The twelve, whom Jesus was focusing on at the time, were all part of that meal, that conversation, so they heard it. So when, the, when Jesus told the man in the crowd that his family dispute was none of Jesus' business, the twelve probably connected the dots and realized that in the absence of love, just about any and every practice of God's law would be flawed. The practice of God's law is necessary but it must be practiced with love, otherwise it will always be flawed. Now as for the man in the crowd, his lack of love was probably known to Jesus. And it probably wasn't that one time. Perhaps he had not practiced love all along. So for Jesus, in the absence of love, and given the rest of the circumstances, there was no point for Jesus to intervene. What about the rich man? Like the man in the crowd, he seemed right, he seemed correct, in part. What he planned for was proper, and what he missed was impossible to know. So how are we to learn from this? This is the closing remark of Jesus in 1221. This is how it will be for whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich towards God. Jesus found him poor, poor toward God, and that made him a fool. So what has God taught about being rich toward him? What does it mean to be rich toward God? And in that regard, how did the rich fool fail God? Jesus gave the answer later, Right, in verses 29 to 34. And do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. For the pagan would run after such things. And your father knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom and these things will be given to you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock. For your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out. A treasure in heaven that will never fail. Where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Sounds simple. Give to the poor. Is that it? Well, it probably isn't. But it's a great start. Giving collected crops, right, going back to the context of the rich fool who was a farmer, giving collected crops to the poor is not part of the law because God already has harvesting laws in Leviticus 19.9 that would provide some to the poor. And presumably, the rich fool had obeyed that. Giving to the poor is on top of the law. That's the love that God wants his people to practice because we could never implement the law perfectly and love bridges the gap of our limitations. So the point of the rich fool wasn't about the barn nor his retirement plan, but his lack of love for the poor. Maybe, just maybe, if he had planned to give more to the poor even though he was not required to, he would have earned the praise of God and Jesus. And his lack of love probably wasn't one time. It was probably his character, right? The event just revealed him more transparently. So let's sum up before we look at applications. We began with Jesus teaching the Twelve. Before the story began, he was teaching them about what he sees versus what the world sees. For example, the Pharisees seemed pious but were in fact corrupt in God's eyes. Then we saw a man in the crowd thinking that he had a case to plead, so he sought the help of Jesus. Our Lord, discerning his true motive, told him that such a dispute was none of his business. Turning to the twelve, he taught them about the rich fool, 
who planned for his great harvest in vain because he was about to die. Then Jesus closed with a lesson on being rich towards God by giving to the poor, not just as a command by the law, but above and beyond. So if we were to sum up the whole lesson, it's to be generous to the poor so we can be rich towards God. Seemingly, right? Be generous to the poor so we can be rich towards God. Time to square up with me. Who finds this trivial? Now I know none of you dare to say that Jesus' parable is trivial, but who finds my application, so directed at me, right? Who finds my application to the parable, namely, to be generous, who finds that trivial? Now you don't have to feel awkward about that. When I first arrived at this during preparation, I found it trivial too, right? It's only when I revisited the context behind that I realized its importance. The context was what Jesus sees versus what we see. And we have seen two examples already, right? The man in the crowd and the rich fool. So what about generosity and giving to the poor? It seems like a nice thing to do, right? It's nice, good, but hardly important enough. You know, like a second tier Christian virtue, right? So to speak. You know, the first tier being hope, faith, and love, and you know, this would be second tier, right? That's how it seems. Being rich towards God, or not being rich towards God, how are we to understand this? To the rich man, right, the key word was rich. To be specific, the, the key word was his richness or wealth. So the plans to build a bond, right, wisely planned as it might have been, right, it was all about him. And to take things easy thereafter, right, morally acceptable as it may have been, was all about him. So when Jesus called him a fool, it wasn't about the barn or his plan. It was about his oblivious attitude towards God. He had not sought God on what to do with his riches, and that made him a fool. Have we sought God on the same issue? Whether we are living off our salary or have more than enough for three generations, the principle applies. Are we seeking God about what to do with our riches? And as I have repeatedly shared from, from this pulpit, a more comprehensive word for riches is resources. Because resource would include wealth, time, and talent. Wealth, time, and talent. And we need to seek God on all three. Do we seek God on what to do with all that he has blessed us with? Now coming back to Jesus' answer, right, one more time from 1134. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possession and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourself that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will never fail, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Generosity is not just giving money, time, and talent. Yes, giving is essential, but there's more. Generosity is giving by first seeking God's direction, then give. God wants a directing role. God wants a directing role in our giving because generosity, generosity is the closest thing we can practice that echoes the grace of God. Generosity is the closest thing we can practice that echoes the grace of God, right? And in particular, giving to the poor is the most important mission after evangelism, as far as the apostles were concerned. So let me say it one more time, right? Generosity is not a second-tier Christian virtue after hope, faith, and love. 
generosity is the closest thing we can practice after the grace of God. And giving to the poor is the most important mission after evangelism. Now that's a lot to download, right? Let me repeat. I'll back it up with two texts and you can read on your own when you have time. In Romans 8.32 we read, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? God's greatest gift, of course, is eternal life through the blood of Jesus. And yet, here we see that God gives other gifts out of his generosity as an extension of his grace. The other gifts matter. And similarly for us, practicing generosity is not just being socially nice. It is an extension of the grace that we have received from God. As for giving to the poor, we read in Galatians 2, 9 to 10. James, Peter, and John, those esteemed as pillars, gave me, me as Paul, and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me. They agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. All they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor the very thing I had been eager to do all along. When Peter, James, and John met with Paul, first priority was evangelism. Second priority, giving to the poor. Right? The apostles, the big three together with Paul, right, recognized under the guidance of the Holy Spirit that their mission included both Jews and Gentiles and that caring for the poor must immediately follow, right, wherever they missioned. In other words, generosity is part of the Great Commission. Generosity is part of the Great Commission. Just to be clear, it need not be a Christian ambition to alleviate global poverty. We know from Jesus that poverty will remain till the end of time. What we are called to do is to give diligently wherever we have access. We give diligently wherever we have access. And that is earth-shatteringly important. God established through the apostles that evangelism and caring for the poor are the preeminent ministries. And therefore, the closing application I want to suggest is not to go do this and go do that. That would be hasty and short-lived. Rather, I want to encourage you all and myself to pray consistently for a change of hearts and minds, that as we yearn for richness towards God, evangelism and caring for the poor would become a renewed priority in our lives. During the early stages of COVID, I heard about another local church that had put their entire cash reserve on the line right, as they purchased the necessary for the poor in their neighborhood. They put their entire cash reserve on the line, right. They prepare care packages and deliver them to hundreds of families week in, week out. As a result, tens of families came to know Jesus and received him. The church practiced what the apostles did. When I heard that, I felt encouraged, but was also ashamed. I was the interim pastor at the time, and it did not occur to me to do any of that. It did not occur to me to do any of that. So quite lame, really. And I was quite lame. Soon after, Pastor KK came, and wave five began to hit Hong Kong hard. We had an opportunity to minister through our generosity. And that time, I got a bit hasty. I told the elders, let's go all in, right? Let's go all in. God is wiser than me. He knows that we need to learn. We need to learn how to practice generosity step by step. And our generosity has to be purposeful. Not just giving, but rooting our giving in the Great Commission as God directs. Not just giving, right, but rooting it in the Great Commission as God directs. In the end, our church gave between 10 to 15 percent 
<coughs> excuse me, 10 to 15 percent of our entire reserve to care programs and by grace. We now have a partnership where we could continue to minister through giving and other forms of caring. And the 9-11 service will be an extension of that. I learned a bit from that process. I really learned from that process and would like to think that God changed me a little bit through that too. Right? I probably could not have prepared today's message without the experience of the last eight months. What seems to be versus what is? What Jesus sees versus what we see? It's a big lesson and it could only be learned first through revelation from God and then through our obedience in practice. But for the revelation of God, who could have thought that generosity is such an important Christian character or that giving to the poor is a preeminent Christian ministry? May God continue to review to us what he sees so that we can discern reality and may the Holy Spirit give us a yielding heart that we would put into practice the vision that God gives us. Let's pray. Father, it's amazing that even though what you see is so much higher than what we see, you found us worthy to be given your revelation. Father, we pray that as you revealed that the Holy Spirit would change our hearts, make them yielding that we could put into practice what you want us to see. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.